Blog Talk Radio. What is it you want, Barry? What do you want? You you want the moon? Just say the word and I'll throw a lasso around it and pull it down. By the light of the silvery moon, I want to spoon to my honey I'll croon love. Honeymoon, keep a shining in June. Your silvery beams will bring love dreams, will be cuddling soon. By the silvery moon. Like wow, the moon was full last night. <laughs> hello, hello, and welcome to tonight's show. You are listening to The Vibrarian Radio on Blog Talk Radio, and my name is Joelle, Miss J, as my friends like to call me, and I am The Vibrarian, and I'm really excited to be here tonight for my second broadcast on Blog Talk Radio with this show, and I am actually contacting you from uh, Playa del Carmen, Mexico, where I am currently staying. So it is a beautiful evening, and of course, the moon is very visible. Uh, When you get outside of city pollution, it is just wonderful to see, and that is our topic of the night, the moon. (laughs) So I am broadcasting. You can contact by calling in at 8988. You can call in and press 1 if you want to talk with me. You can also listen online on our uh, Blog Talk Radio site, which is blogtalkradio.com slash the library. You can see tonight's show streaming in real time, and then you can also check uh, previous episodes for the rebroadcast. So the purpose of my show is to elevate the vibration by sending out positivity and information and to sit down and have a conversation every week about the things that we can learn from each other. So as you know, I'm actually a professional librarian, a real live librarian with a degree, but I'm using my library and superpowers for good and trying to elevate the energy of the world around me. Tonight, our show, we're going to talk about the moon. Now, Let me put a little parameter about the conversation because there are a lot of angles that we could go on this. I think we're going to save the whole did we really land on the moon conversation for a future show. And tonight we're going to just talk about the moon, its place in cultural history, and its energy that happens in our lives. That way we can look at improving it. So... um, (laughs) I, and all my friends who are listening know that I love a good uh, conspiracy type of conversation, but tonight I'm going to keep it in the energy and positivity. So the moon. How many times have you heard people say, oh, people go crazy during a full moon. They just lose their minds. The psych wards fill up, the people getting domestic Uh, disputes with their loved ones, things just seem to go crazy. And we all kind of have a little, uh, it's kind of like if a black cat crosses your path, a superstition, I think, has been prevalent about the moon, like it causes lunacy. Luna, the moon in Latin, so lunacy, he's a lunatic. So there's a connotation that the moon makes people change, turn into werewolves under the light of the moon. I mean, who hasn't seen a good scary story that involves some kind of sinister transformation that happened to the person under the light of their moon? They burst forth as the true beastly animal that they really were inside. (laughs) I think it's interesting because popular culture movies uh, kind of show us some of the aspects of the symbolic place of things like the moon. I mean, that certainly, uh, and we'll get into that a little bit later in the show in terms of internal effect of the moon, but certainly 
lovers love to meet under the moonlight, take a stroll. So there's a romantic kind of feeling about the moon as well. Um, the most romantic songs are written about candlelight and moonlight and the softness of each other's touches, you gaze into the glowing light of the moon. <laughs> I mean, who doesn't want to experience that, right? <laughs> As I walk along the beach out here, I see all kinds of people having their little private dinners on the beach under the light of the moon shining on the ocean, and I certainly don't blame them, and I pause for a moment or two myself on more than one occasion. <laughs> so I want to start from a little bit of ancient and more primal connection that we have with this object in our sky, the moon. And once again, the phone number is 646-668-8988. If you would like to call in and to leave a message, I'll certainly uh, get you on the air. So at one point in our culture, actually prior to what we use now, the Julian calendar, uh, which is the, after Julius Caesar, we were using primarily in cultures around the world the lunar calendar. So if you're looking at what a, a, the most basic beginnings of cultures had in terms of being able to govern their lives, they knew the world around them. So the biggest things in their external world were the sun and the moon. And so these two things, the cycles of these two objects to the naked eye, began to be kind of the first way that we learned to develop time and mark consciousness of time. So from the rising of the sun, bringing the start of the day and the setting down of it, bringing it into the ability to do certain kinds of work or labor um, because of not being able to see. I mean, it was very much a rudimentary and functional way of keeping time. Uh, it was very purposeful and served to facilitate you existing within the natural world around you. So the moon and its changing of shape, what we know as the phases of the moon, are almost like the, the minutes on a clock if you're looking at the moon as a calendar. So they would know that the cycle of the moon of 28 days, uh, having observed this. How, and this, the job of observing this was the wise people, the elders of the tribe, the learned folks who accessed the oral knowledge from others passed down to them about what they were seeing, about how long the sun was in the sky or when the sun disappeared from view or when the moon disappeared from view. So many of these uh, societies had ways of annotating that. I mean, even if you look at Stonehenge, people say that that is one giant clock. So it might have been carvings. It could have been etchings. Uh, they're finding all manner of archaeological records. But they even, as far as I think I read, 32,000 years old that reference a lunar marking of time. So I think that is no accident that we're drawn to the moon in our modern time at all. Um, obviously, the ancients looked up and we look up too. Uh, I guess when we're not being distracted by our devices and the lives that we're living, <laughs> we take the time still to look up into the sky. So if you have this moon kind of marking of time, it also, what happens on the smaller happens on the larger, and the micro sense is the macro. So you have the phases of the moon, and then you also would wind up having the passages of seasons. So there are several points during the year when there are uh, equinoxes and solstice, and these are times that the sun aligns with certain aspects and the moon aligns with certain aspects, and those times herald then the change of the season. So, um, and it, I also welcome anyone to contact me with any kind of correction because I love information and I'm always researching and would gladly uh, correct any information I have that is actually incorrect. I welcome the challenge. <laughs> 
So uh, in terms of then taking it from the monthly kind of cycle to the year and knowing that uh, throughout the year then um, it became favorable, you needed to know when to put in your crops. You needed to know when to plant uh, so that you would be able to use the daylight available to you, so that you would be able to use either the rain available to you, the moisture available to you. So through the collection of this wisdom and knowledge, then people began to understand that they could plant at a, a certain moon. And for example, we're getting ready this week for what is known as the harvest moon. So the harvest moon is the moon in this month, which is closest to the fall equinox, which from what I understand, this is the beginning then of the harvest season, when all of the seeds that were planted at the vernal or spring equinox uh, come to their fruition and begins the time of us bringing in, bringing in those crops, bringing in that wealth, uh, the, the calves are birthed, the livestock, the, the new babies are born, uh, you know, according to certain cycles. Um, and so I love the fact that this September moon is the harvest moon because I love fall. Now, I'm personally biased <laughs> because I was born in the fall. I was born in October. So there's something about the way that fall feels, at least in the United States, North America, that I just feel really wonderful inside when I start to have that kind of fall feeling in the air. And I know that the beautiful fall full moons are just gorgeous. They seem to just hang over the sky uh, in such a clear way, which is beautiful. Now, I'm not saying that I'm not biased <laughs> because I might be, but certainly we all uh, in American culture tend to look forward to Thanksgiving time and the harvest and the kind of gathering with family and friends to be thankful for them that harvest. These are extensions of customs that were evolved from cultures that were honoring nature's cycles, despite what we may think about materialism and things of that nature in terms of our celebrations. There actually is a fundamental reason for there to be Thanksgiving. And we're now into that phase by the end of this week, and we can tell by this moon that now it's going to be time to do that. One of the things that people always have heard of that we learned about in school was the Farmer's Almanac. So the Farmer's Almanac was a little lovely pamphlet that shows the calculations. And farming, uh, you know, there's a such thing as moon phase farming. And pretty much that's what farming, you know, farming really was. And they're saying that during the moon phase, uh, that's how they know when it's going to be rainier. They know when it's going to be drier. So they know when it's time to cut certain crops out of the field. And certain things are said to be done better if they're planted by the light of the moon. So, you know, the Farmer's Almanac, which is, you know, prevalent in the 1700s in, in this country as a way for people to know when certain dates were happening, it was clearly notating for people when the moon was moving, what phase it was going to be in, what dates it moved and transitioned from place to place. So it was considered important. So I think that that shows us that not only is the moon important in the, from the natural sense, it is very also important in our sense. And we are nothing but natural beings. So uh, it's very interesting because as you start to talk about planetary objects and stars and things, there's the conversation around astronomy, which is considered more of the mainstream science versus astrology, which by some has been considered pseudoscience, but what we are learning is that um, it was actually one of the oldest sciences and that astrology was very key to the fundamental workings of, of 
prim primitive civilizations and more advanced civilizations that arose throughout our, our more modern history of the last few thousand years. So <clears throat> when you start to talk about uh, using the moon or the stars to look at your sky, to look at when you're born, to look at that, sometimes that takes people out of their comfort zone, which uh, is because we've heard or learned different things of fear based on perhaps religious instruction or things like that. But in the most natural sense, following the stars that you can see, just like looking at the color of the leaves or the grass or the ground or the the fullness of the rivers or the narrowness of the rivers during droughts. All of these things are observations that we cannot, I think, discount. And one of the exciting things about the moon is the moon on a daily basis in our planet is pulling the tides of the ocean in and out every day. And it's like 60%. I don't know what percentage surface of the of the earth is covered with water, but we know it's a lot. And I think we are similarly created of water as human beings. So we're 60, 70% water in our cellular material. So if the moon has the power and ability to measurably in the terms of sea level, in and out, shorelines, in and out. If it can move an object as great and mighty as an ocean, all of the oceans and lakes and waters, how could it not possibly have some kind of effect on us? To me, the, uh, that's the best proof that I need, is observing something greater than myself be responsive to something. You've convinced me, you know. I don't need to see, uh, I don't need to burn up in flames, you know, to know that a flame is going to kill me. I can watch a flame burn a tree that is bigger and greater than me and understand the consequence of flame. So I think that I can also therefore do the same thing with the moon. So the conversation will be able to move into the second half of my discussion about the moon when we start to look at the symbolism of those movements and the phases that a moon is going through. So my name is Ms. J, and you're listening to The Vibrarian, and this is our second episode on the Mysterious and Mighty Moon. My phone number is 646-668-8988. If you would like to call in and then also talk with me, please press 1, and I'll put you on the line. I welcome any comments or anything that you have to contribute because we're all, again, learning together. So we're looking at the moon and the phases of things that happen. When it's a new moon, the new moon is when there is no moon visible and the sky is dark. And of course, the full moon then is when the moon is revealed in its fullest roundness, in its fullest state, and oftentimes closest point to Earth, uh, which it is beautiful to see when those moons that are so close to Earth happen. But uh, so the new moon is when it is darkest outside. And in terms of the way nature and the new moon work, new moon would be the equivalent of the planting seed under, under the darkness or inside. So if you look at that in terms of yourself, it's a new moon. Everything is fresh and new. I have a blank slate. So what do I want to plant at my new moon? And I mean, that's a question we're always asking ourselves, right? What do I want to, what do, I want to do next? Do I want to encounter a new job? Do I want to learn a new skill? 
Do I want to experience something new? Do I want to move somewhere? What, you know, what is it that I want to plant purposefully in my life in order to have it manifest or come to harvest? So the new moon time, we can start to be observant of that in the sky and use that energy not just accidentally, you know, we might have been already kind of uh, trending towards moon-driven behavior and just not aware of it. And I think that that's actually probably likely the case, again, because we've got that huge influence of the moon's pull on every fluid type of matter on this planet. So if you consciously then begin to manage that, it's like strewing seeds haphazardly on the ground as you pass by. Yes, you'll get some things that will come up to crop. But if you instead plant in an orderly fashion at your crops in the way that they need to be planted, then you will see a more bountiful harvest, a more purposeful harvest. And, and that, again, in spirit and in truth, in nature as inside and outside. So if you're taking this the new moon energy and planting your seeds, then at the full moon, you are manifesting the energetic fruit of that. And I'm, it doesn't necessarily happen within that 14-day, half-month cycle. But certainly, uh, if you observe and use the energy to continually water your plant or foster your seeds, your project, your ideas that you came up with, the whole idea is that as the moon grows larger in the sky and to its fullest point, then that energy will also grow larger in your life. The seed will grow, your project will flourish, all of that then to come to the point when it is growth and then ready to harvest. So I think it's kind of exciting because even like a baby takes nine months or 36 weeks a certain number of lunar cycles until it is born. So it didn't, it, the baby isn't fertilized and comes out in 14 days. No, the seed is planted. Baby comes out in nine months if you're a human. can be a lot longer if you're an elephant. You know, I think this is like 36 months the elephant is pregnant. Never had kids, but that seems like a lot. <laughs> you know. So, but during that time, just like with the crops, you're watering, you're feeding, you're nurturing your project, your baby, whatever it is, until the child is born. And I have it from very good authority from a good friend of mine, Kimmy, who is a labor and delivery nurse, that it is absolutely true that women go into labor on a full moon. And I'm sure that, again, has to do with the amniotic fluid and the pull of the gravitational influence. And, um, you know, I'll take her experiential <laughs> expertise over my own. But I think it's kind of exciting to see that, you know, even though there's a lot of superstition and maybe misinformation, at a fundamental level, people really do realize that there is something very magical about the moon. So, when your full moon happens at the middle of the cycle, you can take that opportunity to take things that you wish to have grow less in your life. Just like the moon is going uh, less and less, so too can we let things go out of our life and release them or use the energy of the the moon to contribute to our effort to let them go. So there is a lot of information, you know, on the Internet, on YouTube and things like that that have really excellent videos and things about ways that people are trying to observe the energy of the moon uh, in terms of doing personal rituals or personal intention or vision boards 
in order to plant seeds and use all of that. Um, I do hope you will go over to my YouTube channel. Uh, you can just search for The Vibrary, V-I-B-E-R-A-R-Y, and there you will find a lot of information. I'm building a collection of information that I have found informative and uplifting. And, of course, we're uploading uh, the broadcast from the show from week to week. But uh, things such as the moon and manifesting, what we call manifesting with the moon, uh, you can find a lot of information about that, and I'll be sure to place some links there for you to look at so that you have some of the same background information that I'm working for myself. So at the moon, then, if you're trying to release things from your life, and I think even if you weren't necessarily going to go ahead and try to use the moon in a conscious way, it is still good for us to look at what we need to release in our life. We, it's good for us to look at what we need to plant to bring into our life. You know, one of the things in, in the less technologically cushy societies is that we kind of had to think about those things more. Now there's so many conveniences and stuff that we don't have to think about things. We're kind of haphazard, uh, so to speak, uh, because life happens on automatic. So I think that any kind of time when you can stop and maybe look at your life differently instead of having it on autopilot and say, okay, am I planting seeds? Am I planting the seeds of my own crop? Or am I currently just existing, doing something for someone else's crop? Have I personalized this, what I'm, what I'm doing and where my energy is going? Or am I just unconsciously participating in somebody else's crop and harvest cycle? You know, for me, it's very important that I could gladly be a contributor to someone, but I also want to be managing my own field, tending to my own crops internally and externally. And I think that all of us want to live purpose, a purpose-driven life. I think that was a book. Uh, was, I don't remember who the author was. The librarian in me is going to have to look that up. <laughs> I want to say Franklin Covey, but I think that was more about a productive work day, not real sure. <laughs> but, uh, you know, to have a sense of purpose of living your life and saying, I'm going to plant seeds and then I will reap the harvest of those seeds, uh, I think that that is a wonderful conscious way to kind of grab hold of what is already happening. Because the fact of the matter is things grow uh, and they um, they wither and die, they grow, they are not static, they change, birth happens, death happens, all of these things are unavoidable pieces of our reality. So rather than letting things accidentally grow because we didn't think about them and we didn't take the time to um, be mindful or to water the crop or to pull the weeds that were growing up, uh, all those kind of things are very real. You know, so I think one of our callers says the book is Rick Joyner, The Purpose Driven Life. Uh, thank you. Thank you. We'll definitely be looking that up and adding that to the video library. Oh, and let me give a shout out to the ladies at Speak Natural Hair Design in East Point, Atlanta, who they just logged in and said that they are listening to the broadcast this evening from the salon. Thanks, ladies. I love you guys, and I really appreciate your support and positivity. If you all are looking for a wonderful natural hair design for locks, braids, natural hair of all types, these are the ladies to go to. And yes, that is free advertising because not only are uh, I'm a happy and satisfied client <laughs> when I'm in Atlanta, so and I miss you guys terribly. Thank you so much for listening, Stacey and Nia. So <laughs> as we were saying, we are getting into the ways to use our energy 
and to look at the natural object of the beautiful moon as an example of how we can do that. My name is Ms. J, and this is the Library Radio Hour, and I'm broadcasting on the Library Radio Network. So uh, you can check us out on Blog Talk Radio, and of course you can call in to speak at 646-6688. I definitely will put you on if you have something you want to say. And I would also like to say hello to my good friend Beeman, who is listening here in Playa del Carmen. Beeman, thank you so much. He is an awesome, positive man, and I have to let you know him and his wife Chantel have a retreat business down here in the Yucatan in, in Mexico, and I will definitely share information with you all on the future episode because he is there doing some really positive things about making sure that your body and is healthy and your mind and body and spirit connected to that. So thanks for tuning in, Demon. <laughs> so you'll, I'm really excited because I am actually my own producer and the host and the chat moderator all at the same time. So as I shared last week, I'm learning, and you all get to learn with me. So uh, I'm excited to, <laughs> to be able to be acquiring some new skills on the fly here. So bear with me, and we'll learn and grow as we go along. So in terms of moon energy and using that then to manifest, and we talked about doing purposeful uh, intention and using the, the energy to add our energy to that that is already existing in order to do something. So this week we have a eclipse. I absolutely love sky phenomena. I love seeing comets. I love seeing uh, eclipses, uh, um, anything that I can do. I used to work in um, the tallest building in Atlanta, the tallest occupied office floor in Atlanta, the SunTrust building. And one of the best things about the job was that the library was on the 55th floor, and there was wall-to-wall -wall glass windows that had the best view of downtown Atlanta, not even just downtown Atlanta, all of Atlanta, out to the suburbs all the way, uh, to the mountains and everything. So I was able to go up there. We could go up to the building for things like 4th of July to see fireworks over the city and things like that. And so there were several times that I was able to go up there to have a perfect bird's eye view um, of the phenomenon that happened. I got to see Comet Ison go across the sky, and I've been to see at least a few eclipses. I think uh, my uh, Bessie Tanya, who is also listening, she came up there with me with her son Jet to see an eclipse at one point in time. I think we've been up there at the wee hours of the morning because that's when it was most observable. But I didn't want to miss an opportunity to be that close to seeing something so amazing, such as an eclipse, when the sky darkens and you can see that shadow then go across this object. I mean, that is amazing in modern times. And I can imagine in ancient times how amazing it was to have this unusual, or what would seem like at first it would seem unusual, it wasn't until they started observing when these uh, eclipses would happen that they began to know to anticipate them. But they say in a lot of the mythology around the moon that there was great fear in sometimes when the moon would disappear, when the sun would go black, and it caused great upheaval in society because here are these objects that had been uh, routine and fixed and happening with regularity for days and weeks and months at a time, all of a sudden were disrupted and no longer visible. So it, it is a disruption to the daily habit if at one point in time you're in the fields and you look up and the sky goes black. So eclipses are when the sun and the moon 
and the earth pass between. I'm not a scientist, I'm not Neil deGrasse Tyson, but I know that there is something that passes through the normal light and causes then the shadow to obscure the other object. And I do know that solar and lunar eclipses are paired. They come right after the other because of the actual physical placement of the sun, moon, and earth. They are partnered events. So the solar eclipse, when the sun disappeared, it would disrupt what was happening on the earth. So all of a sudden you're in your field or in your tent or out and whatever you were doing as a first person, and the sun disappears in the middle of the day. All work stops. There's something outside of us has changed drastically. So that is the energy of the solar eclipse on our lives. And so what you will find is that around a solar eclipse, there may have been things that changed drastically in your internal, external environment. It might have been some policies changed at your job, uh, something changed in your logistics, you had to take a new route because of road construction on a permanent basis. You know, all of these things, it's something external that was regular and happening and set up before that now is no longer that way. And so you could look to the time at the beginning of September of this month, and the energy of the solar eclipse is said to go for about six months after it happens. So it would be something you could look at as you start to encounter your life situation. It's when you're hit with some kind of major disruptive influence. It was triggered by this solar eclipse, this change in the impact to our external world. And right behind this solar eclipse then in tandem and connection with it is the lunar eclipse. So lunar, the lunar, the moon, again, the moon deals with water, and it pulls the tides and the oceans, it pulls our inner selves. But water is also representative of emotions. I mean, look what you cry, you get teary-eyed, when you get overcome with emotion. You can laugh so hard you cry. <laughs> you know, so... Um, Water is uh, representing of the movement of uh, some say of spirit of energy. It's our internal working. So the, so the lunar, the darkness of the night. So when the moon then is blocked out and that light disappears, that full moon disappears for that time period. That is where we, or the planet, is reacting to the change in the external environment. So it may be that, let's use the example that um, our job just announced that we're getting ready to merge. We're, let's say we work for a company X and there's a buyout offer and things are going to change. We don't know exactly how they're going to change, but we know things are going to be different and the merger will take place in the next six months. Wow. Coincidence? Okay, probably not, because the energy is there for some kind of big radical shift. So how you respond to that then when you learn that news that your job is going to be changing or that uncertainty of something new coming. That is what the lunar eclipse gives us an opportunity for, is to have our emotional response to the external world. We are approaching one on Friday, and it is very much a prime example because not only is it an eclipse, but it is eclipsed in Pisces, which Pisces is like one of the quintessential water sign of emotions in flow. Uh, and again, I'm getting into some form of astrology, but you know, uh, astrology astronomy are, are, are old sciences and it's really 
not able to have a conversation without including some of that because we're also talking about things that are constellations, named constellations. That's how important they are. So, uh, you know, if, if we're having an eclipse at this point, you know, you can expect that it might be that you've had some kind of emotional revelation. Maybe you're just feeling differently. Uh, maybe there there has been some kind of uh, interaction with somebody that you see them differently. Uh, maybe the new changes on your job are going to disrupt how you're feeling overall. It may make you happier overall, or it may make you decide, you know what, I don't think I can be here anymore. And that emotional realization then will drive you to change what you do and to move away then into whatever is going to be the new thing, the post-eclipse, the post-shift, the post-response reality that you're going to be living in. Now, the people who I am learning from on the Internet are astrologers like Pam Gregory and Barbara Goldsmith, who I just adore her personality. She's so bubbly. And Dali Manga, to name a few. So there are folks who are talking more so about the astrology and how the movement of the planets and the moon uh, connect with us and to do our developmental work. So that's the arena that I'm presenting to you, the information that I know. You know, uh, as a woman, I know that our menstrual cycles, our ability to become pregnant and to be fertile, work on the same cycles of the moon. And a lot of people, you know, will say that most women naturally will be in conjunction with the flow of the moon with their cycle started. Excuse me if I weirded out any guys who are listening, but I mean, it's a fact of life and reality. And everybody knows you know, when you do and don't want to make a baby, what to do and not to do. <laughs> so, but going back to moving through an eclipse, I think that it's a very exciting time to use that energy and opportunity to stay and to do a review and observe you know, when the sun stops shining, what's done in the dark, what they say, what's done in the dark comes to light. So we have an opportunity to have darkness of the unusual. Uh, like the sun goes away, the moon goes away. And so in that dark time, we can really reveal some things if we are willing to look. So... Right now, if you're looking at how your world has changed and is moving, how you're going to respond to that. And one of the other aspects that's happening right now, and we'll talk about this also in a future show, is Mercury retrograde. So Mercury is a planet, a messenger planet, and it goes retrograde, which means it's ellipsis, the uh, it doesn't actually go backwards, but it's ellipsis gives the, um, it goes around its ellipsis to the rear side rather than to the forward side. So we call those retrogrades. And uh, during, it, it's gotten a bad rap because during that time, things with communication can kind of go astray, go awry. Um, things on the French technology, things of that nature, messages be misinterpreted and all that. So basically, retrograde times are a period for us to review, reevaluate, to uh, research, to go back over something that reworking. Uh, to, we go back over those things to see, to be presented another opportunity to maybe learn from them and do them differently during a retrograde. So if over the last three weeks, the solar eclipse started, I think it was about uh, two weeks, 15 days ago, right, or two weeks ago. 
So the solar eclipse happened in the middle of this period of us reevaluating ourselves and looking at ourselves uh, and reviewing and repositioning ourselves. And now here we have just at the uh, conclusion of and culmination of this full moon and this eclipse, Mercury comes out of retrograde and starts going forward. So we've had an opportunity to look at our responses. You hear that re, re, responses, reevaluate, research, review, renew, reprioritize. There's a common thing here. So we've had that opportunity to do that. And then uh, with the eclipse, we can go and we can just really let go. Let those things be eclipsed out that no longer serve us and be moving into the newness without uh, baggage or without clutter or without that old, the thing that we've seen that we may not want to bring forward, we have an opportunity to release that during the eclipse time. And I, for one, am always looking for a way to improve and if decluttering and releasing. Sometimes we don't want to revisit stuff. We like to leave it where it was. But the funny thing is, is that that doesn't necessarily work because the universe, the, it, the planet doesn't stay fixed in the sky. Things don't stay unchanged. They don't stay the same. So just like that, we're going to be moved into an orbit where we are going to have to revisit and rework and reevaluate our trajectory to see if we're on the right path. Um, so eclipse seasons are known as a powerful series of events because of their trigger. They're like they take the energy of a full moon, which is already about bounty and harvest and fullness and big, big energy, and it's like they say it's like a full moon on steroids at eclipse. So it's almost like you are exploding a rocket or a super powered fuel into the situation. And you can really then, whoosh, you know, ignite it and be in a very radically placed once eclipse season is done. So the last two years, we were in a series of eclipses that had to do with that were happening in the signs of Aries, which is the first sign of the zodiac, and Libra, which is the seventh. And Libra is about partnership and balance, our relationship with others, our relationship with our employer, our loved ones, the external balance in those things. And Aries is very much the individual. And so we, during these eclipse seasons the last two years, we were probably presented with ways that situations that challenged our idea of what relationship was really looking like. We might have been presented with situations where we had to be more independent, like Aries. You know, maybe something in our, soul, in our work environment, we were given more responsibilities, or we might have been pushed around and we decided we needed to assert ourselves more as an individual and say, no, this is about me. We might have had to learn to say no more easily in the last two years. We might have had to learn to say yes to working with people, to partnering with people in the last two years. So if you look back, maybe you can see where that energy expresses itself in your life. But this one here gives us an opportunity to look at our emotions. And are we happy? Are we feeling positively about the situation external to us? Are we really vibing with the reality around us? And if we feel an emotion and it is not wanted, then we get an opportunity to release that because we've been spending the last period of time kind of reviewing all of that, and so we might be forced to release it. You know, if, you're, if your job lays you off and you have an emotional response to it, you might be forced to deal with it in a way that does not match your emotional response. I mean, because 
And quite frankly, that could probably be a good thing because most people are probably not going to respond super well at first to something radically external like a layout. You know, uh, it could be something as much as uh, somebody coming to you and telling you something about a relationship that you presume to already know, and it was a sudden shock to you to learn, no, it was not this, you know. And then what is your emotional moving forward to that, and how do you go? What does your new beginning look like? So in the last few days or a few days coming forward, there's going to be an opportunity for us to, according to Dolly Manka on YouTube, I love this little phrase, you're going to receive a clear indicator of whether you want to go on with a situation or not. So it may be that there's something in your house that you've been putting up with that in the next week or two, you just going to be, you know what, I'm not dealing with this anymore. We're putting the house in the market. We're going to sell it. We're going to go. And you decide to release the, the tension of the things not being exactly like you want to be or whatever problems and dramas are going along into the house. And you decide to release it and go ahead and move forward from it because you've been influenced by that energy of the moon. So I like to look at monitoring what's happening around me energetically in the larger sense, I find it helpful to try to align my energy with a larger energy that to me there seems to be evidence is happening. And if you have any tips or, you know, tricks or things that you do um, in relationship to the moon or what kind of experience has the moon have you had uh, on um, with the moon, I would love to hear from you. And you can give me a call at 646-668-8988. So I know that uh, I use one of my most cherished pieces of um, jewelry was a moonstone that I received from my dear friend Stacy, And it was a little crystal. And I could feel, after being out in the moon, I could feel the energy of the crystal being uh, energized. And that's another thing if you are a person who works with crystal energy, earth energy, a great way to charge it is to put them out in the full moon, under the light of the full moon. It gets them all full and charged up. I mean, I'm full and charged up when I'm out under a full moon too. <laughs> but... Uh, I loved it because, and I think uh, my tattoo actually has a moon on it, uh, setting into an ocean. So, I, you know, I guess it has spoken to me from a very deep and personal level for a long time. Uh, I always say I'm a daughter of the moon, you know. And um, I don't know where I got that from, but I've just always felt full to that energy. So... This is the Vibrarian radio show, and my name is Miss J. I'm the Vibrarian. I hope that the information that I've been talking about has been informative and helpful for you at this point. I just wanted to share a little bit with you about some upcoming broadcasts that are going to uh, be on our schedule. I'm really excited that the topics are coming together and people are uh, I've got some wonderful people that are going to come and join me for the conversation to speak about the things that uh, I'm interested in at least, and I think from some of the feedback that I'm getting, other people are as well. So next week, we are going to be talking about the chakras. And some of you might be like, what's a chakra? What? And some of you might be like, oh, my chakra. <laughs> so I'm going to talk about what the chakras are in the first place, and I'm going to have a couple guests. I've already been able to confirm I will be having 
uh, Lucy Lee, who is an energy healer and Reiki master in the Atlanta area, is going to be one of the guest hosts on the show. And I'm waiting for a couple other confirmations. But we're going to be talking about chakras and understanding the basic of our energetic grid and system. And then uh, on the week after that, I'm really excited because I'm going to have an episode on living differently. Nomads, expats, and couch surfers. So there is a there is a um, a lot of people who live different from what we think of as the typical quote unquote American way of life. People who have left the country, people who are traveling, who have picked up and are living in the most unusual and amazing ways. And I want to feature some of those stories, and I have met some wonderful people while I've been traveling myself, and I plan to share some of those people with you all so you can hear how they're doing, what they're doing, where they're living, how, and we can talk about everything, how, how you pay for it how you live it, how you arrange it from navigation, transportation, lodging, and then earning a living, of course, which is something a lot of us are very interested in, how to be more mobile and still be able to make the money that we need to live well. So that is in two weeks, and then we're going to finish out or start out the month of October, I believe, with an episode about who were you? And this topic is going to be about past lives. If you have experienced a past life regression or have knowledge of past lives or have done study or research about it, if you're interested in it as a topic, please contact me at joelle at the com. And I would love to have your story be featured as part of that conversation. And as I said, that will be about three weeks uh, from now. I think it's going to be interesting because we've all kind of heard different things about reincarnation and past lives and stuff. And I'm here to tell you that I know people who have had experiences uh, that are fascinating to hear about. And so we're going to kind of take a peek under the cover, so to speak, and hear those stories of past lives. Were you an Egyptian princess? Did you live during the Italian Renaissance? <laughs> and what that uh, kind of experience has been for people. So that will end up probably our first month of online shows, and I'm just really so excited that um, everyone is so supportive of it, and I am excited to see what happens next. I appreciate the willingness you have to sit and listen to me <laughs> for the time period that I'm on, and I hope that you all will contact me to be able to contribute to the conversation because I certainly am not an expert. I'm just willing to flap my gums about it. So if you would like to come and chop it up with me in uh, the show, please let me know. Give me a call. Contact me during the show or offline, and I'll be glad, glad, glad to have you participate. So I think that our show is winding down now. I'm about to go outside and get a little of the moonlight energy myself. And I'll tell you, my, you know, uh, one of the things that you can do when you're wanting to use the moon energy is to write. Write either your, like in this case with your full moon and the eclipse, you can write down what you wish to release out of your life. Jot it on a piece of paper, burn it in a candle, tear it up with the intention of releasing it in some kind of way, observe that energy of relief, and know that then after the full moon that that thing will be getting smaller. The release will happen and you will be letting it go. You know, honor that with even just the thought of intention, even if you don't get an opportunity to write it down, at least hold that in your mind as a statement. I am letting go of X, Y, Z. 
I am releasing X, Y, Z. I no longer need X, Y, Z. And you release those things with like just a loving and positive energy so that when it's time for the new moon and seeds planted in your life, you will be free of clutter and you will be open and available for the things that you then want to increase. So my name is Ms. J, and thank you so much for joining me, and I look forward to our conversation next week, and I just wish you much peace, love, and elevation of your vibration. Good night. Visita tu distribuidor Chrysler. Ven a dar el grito con nuestro bono patrio y estrena un Chrysler, Dodge, Jeep o Ram con descuentos de hasta 45 mil pesos. Aprovecha, solo del 2 al 22 de septiembre. Consulta términos y condiciones en Chrysler.com.mx. 